Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. With us today is Mr. Terry Ellis. Uh, Terry is known for the uh, real life Ocean's Eleven robbery and he's also now an author and a novelist of four books. Uh, thanks for coming, uh, Terry. It's a pleasure, Lee. How are we doing today? You all right? Yeah, not too bad, mate. I'm uh, a yeah. bit nervous. So, you know, I always find <laughs> a little bit nervous doing these podcasts. I'd, I'd rather fucking rob a bank than uh, <laughs> <that's> a podcast. <laughs> so, to Terry, obviously, um, the Ocean's Eleven robbery was um, quite a high, high tech building that you got into there, isn't it? Yeah, um, I think two, two thousand and uh, two thousand and seven. I was I was approached by by a really good friend of mine. He um, fixes um, high end jobs, so he, he phoned me up, asked me if I could meet him over Hampstead Heath. So I went over and met him, and uh, he said that he was working uh, for a, like a banking consortium of guys that wanted uh, some data retrieved from. Um, a data facility in London. Um, yeah. He said, uh, if, 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 I, if I was up for it, um, could we arrange to, to, to retrieve it? So I said, yeah, let me, let me come and meet you. So I went and met him, and then he explained to me what the place was. Uh, unfortunately, it was Verizon. Uh, it's one of the biggest data centers in Europe. Um, and it's, it's, it's probably one of, of, uh, one of those jobs that most people would never take on, uh, simply because uh, it's got one of the most state-of-the-art uh, security systems. It's got um, it's got everything. So if I if I run through it with you, it sounds sounds a, when I looked into it, it sounds a little bit like the film Mission Impossible, like uh, the the sort of security system you got to get past. Well, you know what? It's, you know, it's, it's like everything. You know, we always go on the on the premise that uh, there's always one there's always one person who is, is going to let the whole security system down. And that's the human element of it. Right. So we so we thought we well, yeah, we'll have a look at it and see what we can do, but. When I, when I realised it was Verizon, and when I told my guys, they all said, no, nah, no, nah, this is fucking, we can't be doing this. It's impossible um, to look But at. I said, we, we're going to have a look at it, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So we had a British Telecom van, we parked up across the road. But we was quite lucky, because my mate had lots of information on it. So we had all the schematics, so we knew, we knew the, the alarm system, we knew basically a hell of a lot about it. But it was just about going down and having a look at it. So if, if, you, if you went around this place, you've got... Um, You've got um, overlapping um, cameras, so right. f- so you've got standard cameras and thermals. So that so the clarity is, is clear day or night. Yeah. So you've got that that content contend with. You've got a perimeter fence all the way around the back of this, and it backs onto a canal. Uh, there's three police stations within a, a mile distance, um, and it's got uh, I think this this place in the daytime is five security guards Blimey. because it's open, and at night time there's ten security guards. Um, if you walk up to the, the front door of this place, it's, it's, a, it's got bulletproof glass. It's an it's a intercom uh, biometric uh, keypad hand scanner and everything else to get so in there. So you can't even walk in there? You can't you even just... walk in there. Um, once, you're, once you're through that door, you come into an airlock compartment. So what mm-hmm. happens is you get buzzed in, you then have to go through an airlock compartment. Um, that's uh, uh, thermostatically uh, pressurised. So oh, you have to shut this door, and once it's pressurised, you can open that door. We call it dead man's land, or it's, it's, it's a human trap. Yeah. If you get caught in that, you're, you're fucked. Um, once, it, once you get through there, you'll then come into a secure lobby, which is, which is uh, the only way out of it is through a turnstile, which is biometrically, biometric um, turnstile. So fingerprint. Fingerprints, yeah. uh, and, and you can do a keypad, and you can buy a biometric uh, card as well. Yeah. And that's the reception. So behind the reception, you've got security guard. Um, he then takes your details and gives you a card so you can get in. Blimey. Um, behind him, there's a security um, CTT camera room. So you've got three security guard operators in there. There's about, I think there's about 30 cameras in there. Does a whole building. It sounds pretty much impossible to me already, Terry. <laughs> oh, it is. Well, you know what? It's, it's, I said nothing's impossible. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so, the, so, so once you go through the turnstile, you have to get through another sealed door and then to get into the security camera, uh, the, the camera um, suite. Uh, and then if we then go onto the first floor, it's, there's, a, there's cameras every 10, 15 foot in this gaff. Um, there's a private security company that, op- that operates independent of Verizon. Um, they have a, their own uh, security system that's on the, the mainframe computer room. So if you get past this, you ain't to get past this. Gotcha. So, so it, you know, there's quite so a few layers there already to get past. I, th- I think there was eight layers of security on this gaff. Um, mm. So for us, it was it really just about looking at it and trying to figure a way of getting in there because in the camera and they've got panic buttons. So right. if you fuck up with the entry, you panic, like, panic buttons are gonna go off. If you get caught in no man's land, you're gonna go off. If you get caught in the foyer, 
you get caught on the turnstiles, you get caught going through this room, and then you make it to the to the CCT camera room, and one of them, uh, you know, look, looks a bit iffy, they're gonna press the, the panic alarm. And if you get past all that, and you go onto the main floor, uh, and one of the, and the security cameras that are, that are up there, they pick you up, then the independent security company will press the panic button as well. So mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was something, and when, when we looked at it, we thought, you know what, that's the information we had. So we thought, how do we get past this? And, and we looked at it for about four weeks, and we just thought, there's no way. You know, we, we watched how many people worked there, which is the best time to do it. Uh, we even went up on the roof, the alarm went off. So, so um, what do you do, like a recce visit and sort of yeah. watch what's going on? What we did, we looked at it, for, I think about three and a half weeks we looked at it, and uh, we had a British telecom van. So what we did, we parked across the road, yeah. um, and then what we just looked, we just kept looking for eight or nine hours every single day. Long so it was one of those jobs because there's we, a lot of background work goes into. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we and then what we did, and then we then measured out where we had to go, and what we did, we measured out over a park. So what we did, we walked through it. So we know that as soon as we got in there, how how we had to come through the the the, uh, the airlock chamber, into the foyer, into into the part of turnstiles, into the CCT suite, sort all that out, and then get upstairs, turn them cameras off if we could. And do it. So what we did, we walked it, and we because we we only had an hour in there before the changeover, right? So or before the screen went up. So because the, 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 um, when, the, when the security system they walk around the building, they got a lock on, so you only get a, gotcha. you get a window so you, of opportunity. Yeah, you're on a time yeah. scale. And so we so there was ten of them in there. So we thought, well, you know, it's an impossible job. You know, at first when we took it, on, we thought, we know, we're not we're not even gonna have this. But because of, of of the challenge for us, you know, because you can't use guns. You can't ram it, you know. You can't just just blag it. You you really need to get in there. And you need to give a, you need a good read. So, yeah. so I looked at it and looked at it and looked at it enough, and we, and we came to the all came to the same conclusion that it's fuck, it was impossible. Can't be done. And and I was lucky. I was I was I was in West Hampstead. I was visiting my mum, and uh, the whole road was uh, was was uh, sealed off by the old bill, and there was a geezer up on the roof, and I said to the couple, "What's what's what's going on?" He said, "There's a geezer threatening to jump," and that's when it pinged up. Oh, you know what? That's what I'm gonna do. So what I did, I, I we went and got a load of police uniforms. Got a, got a police van, dog, uh, dogs. We got an Alsatian dog, uh, police car. And then what I did, I went and I went and hired uh, five guys. They're technicians. Yeah. Uh, they're very, very, uh, they're very well known in in the chip chip world because you have to take chips out and you have to be, and they have to be very delicate. So you have to put them in especially uh, um, stag proof bags. And you put them in, in, in the washing bag. So we had 20 washing bags. I think it was 120 motherboards in all. You know, if, if we were able to get through there. So, so we, we, so, so we got the, everything. We got the police uniforms, everything else. So now it was just about pulling up at the door and, and doing it. So we called a day. I think it was, I think it was for Thursday. Um, because that, that seemed the day that the less people in there. Because we had technicians in there, security guards, cleaners. I think that night there was 16 people in there. And it seemed the best night to get it because normally there's between 20 and 30 people in there. But as we watched it over the week, we realised that Thursday was our was our day. So that's you know we could we could easily yeah. capture 16 people, no no drama. And there was only five of us, and then we got five carriers in the car outside. So we went into police, knocked on the door, and then I just said we've had reports of someone on the roof. And then and the head of security came to the door, and he, I showed him my ID, police ID. I said, open the door, we've got to go up on the roof. And he is a bit tense for a few seconds, then he buzzed me in. So he was in the yeah. foyer, all the security guards were in the back, I could see them all through the window. And I said, we've got someone on the roof. I said, can you let my officers in, we're going to come and search the building. So he buzzed them all, bomb, bomb, bomb. So we got through the, the, the air compartment, and then we was in the foyer, and then we said, can you take us back through the side? And, and it, yeah, I could see that sort of hesitation in him. Yeah. But you know, we was we was we were we all looked apart. Yeah. Then the dog came in. There, I so. suppose there's no reason for him not to believe nah. you if you're if you're dressed as police and yeah. everything fits. So what? you say you even had a dog as well. Yeah, we had an Alsatian you dog. Got the Alsatian yeah. dog with you, mate. So so you know, so visually it looked all right. We all looked apart. We all had radios on. We all had uh, mics and everything, so we could all talk to each other. So once we got through there, and, and it was a blind spot once we went through this, this uh, turnstile. So what I did as soon as we got through there, I, I just said, look, I turned around, I cuffed him up off. I took his biometric card off him, and I and I and I, and I let myself through, and then I had to, I came into the the CCT suite, and I had two of my guys behind me, and they're, they're all six foot, and I said, "Has anyone been up on the roof?" 
And they said, no, so because uh, we've had reports that someone dressed in a security uh, officer's uniform has been up there. And they all said, no. So I said, for my protection and my officer's protection, we need to, we need to all to stand up so we can check out who you are. And that was the only time I was, I was pretty worried because I thought they was going to press the buttons. Yeah. Anyway, they all got up and they all walked towards me and we cuffed them all. And then what we did, we got on, got on the CCT mics and we, we asked all the other security guards to come down and lift. So as, as they came down the list, there was two, uh, three, out, three on the first floor and two on the top floor. So three of them came down, we, we got them, and then me and my pal went up to the, up to the top floor and we grabbed, we grabbed the, uh, the last two. Then we got the technicians and the cleaners, brought them all downstairs. And that, I think that took us about 10 or 15 minutes to do that. I mean, it's quick then. So, yeah, so, so did the security not sort of, uh, obviously wondering why are you cuffing us? What? No, you know, because it's, it's, you know, it was about, we say for our protection and, and their protection, we're going to cuff everyone, we're going to search the building. But, you know, we, 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 we maintain that illusion that right. we are real police so, officers. So they still at that point don't know they, what's yeah, going on. Yeah. They're oblivious. Everything, everything was being done correctly. Yeah. And then, and then uh, what we did then, we had to find uh, uh, the, the CCT circuit board. So we had to go and disconnect that. So what we did, because that's uh, the separate um, separate company were monitoring that. So we so we found that where that was. I went on the front desk, and then I was radio through to my guy and said, "Right, pull him now." So he pulled it, see uh, the, the 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 connections out. Then the phone went off, boff, you know. And I said, "Hello, Verizon. Uh, how can I help you?" And the, and the other guy said, well, "All our cameras have gone down. What's happening now?" I said, "There's been a surge in the mainframe computer system. All the cameras have gone down. Everything's everything's uh, shut down." We should be operational 10, 15, 25 minutes. I said, our technicians are just going in there. He said, right, no problem, off. And I went, go, go, just go. And that was it. Blimey. Yeah, so, we didn't, and so what happens then, as soon as that done, I then radioed through to the guys across the road. They all came in. Uh, they had, uh, they was all, you know, dressed in their attire so they couldn't be seen on anything. And they went up to, to the first floor and then they had their drills. And uh, they spent 40 odd minutes taking all the mother balls out and putting them into, uh, laundry bags, and I, I think outside the room we had 20 bags. I think we worked out 120 mother balls. They're worth 120 thousand dollars a piece. I'm just going to ask about that. So what you're actually stealing is like a, it's a, mother, like a circuit yeah. board. So normally, so is it what state is on there that you're after, or is it the value of these things? Um, the penny and the penny and chips are worth five million. Blimey! So, but we were actually hired to actually go in there and actually take them and give them to someone because they yeah. were interested in the data. But that's that was not not our problem. Yeah. Uh, we eventually found out the date was worth just over 100 million quid, oh. if, if not more, in the right hands. Um, Could just uh, what, what sort of data would that store in there? What sort of is that? Um, well, I, 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 a few, a few uh, months after we did this, it, the banking crisis hit. Right. In 2008. Yeah. We were employed by a banking syndicate to actually go in there and get them. Um, there was a job in Chicago, in Chicago uh, a few months before. Uh, guys that went through a wall in Chicago, tied up all the staff and nicked a load of stuff. There was another job in, um, I think it was EasyNet in London. It's a big uh, data facility. Uh, the guys went in there and they, and they nicked some uh, some cards, some uh, to get in, but they were challenged and they, and they had to do a guide. And I think all the all the all the stuff then was moved to Verizon. It was the most secure facility yeah. in Europe. Uh, so when that when this job came to us, that had already happened. We were told that there was there was a, there was certain information on this that they fucking wanted. Regardless of whatever happened, you need to go and get this, and whatever you want, you can have. So we we put a price on it, and uh, we went in, you know, mm -hmm. and, we, and we retrieved it. They were extremely happy when we when we got out of there um, with it. Uh, it was gone the next day. Uh, it was shipped out. So can I just ask what sort of price would be on that sort of thing to do a job like that? What are we talking? We're talking so? a third. So, you know, we, we go on, we, we, were, we were just doing penny and chips at that time, so I thought we'd about a million off quid. A million off quid. Yeah, so for about an hour's work. Yeah. So it was five of us, and then we paid the, the guys that actually done the, the tech work a few quid. Blimey. So, so where would that go to after that? So you actually got away with that and you come out of that building? Yeah, um, well, we, we, we came out of there. Uh, we, we then had to, we, we drove up Kentish Town. And, and as we got, as we came level with the Kenish Town Police Station, um, all, the, all the, uh, the police fans came out of there. Heading so they, to they, that, they, heading they, to they, that. Well, they did, they cut us off. Right. So we was in a van, and the car, and then the other guys who, who were the tech guys, they had already gone. Yeah. They'd done their job. 
So as we, as we pulled up level with Homes Road, <laughs> all the police cars and vans came out in front of us. Mommy. The dog and my, my pal was in the back and all I kept hearing, what the fuck's going on? I said, it's okay, look, they're, they're just responding, you know. Yeah. But we actually thought they were, they were going to surround us. They right. all came, came around. And it just further up, there's another engine that comes out and then three or four vans came out of there. And it took six minutes for the call to go up and for the old bill to come from three different police stations there. Blimey. So he was pretty lucky. But it was fortunate enough that, you know, they just carried on and they were going to where they were going. So, yeah. we, so we had a little bit of a sigh of relief, yep. a little bit of a smile to ourselves, <laughs> me, and, me, and my, me and my pal. And we just smiled and said, like, we're on our way now. And then we just we, we drove up Amsterdam. We dropped my pal off with a dog. Uh, he went and uh, dropped the dog back. And then we dropped the vans off, dropped the gear off. The vans were taken, the cars were taken to be disposed of. And uh, we then, we arranged for the circuits the next day to be to be taken. So what we did, so I then went down and had the, the, the money transferred. Yep. So I met the guy, the fixer. I met him, I met him in, over um, Kenwood. And I said, like, you know, we got the prize. And he, he was like, he was overjoyed because he had been, he had been, uh, he had been tasked with getting a team together to go yeah. down and do this, and you know I don't think at that time there was anybody willing to do this. We, you know, in the in the in the um, in the in the sort of in the, the chip world and the robbery world, you know, you wouldn't take on a job like this. You'll be uh, you'll be fucking mad. Too many risks there, weren't yeah. there? So. But because we because we, you know, we were fairly organised. I think if you got the right information about a job, and the good thing about us is that everyone knew, knew what they were doing. So we got we got guys that are ex army. Yeah, you know, so old guys that. They've been on bits of work and they, they worked their way up as criminals. So they wasn't yeah. they wasn't easily uh, flustered, you know. When we when we agreed to do it, once they once they had the uniform was on, they were for all intents and purposes old Bill. Yeah, you know. So and they, and they looked apart. So I you played that role as such. Oh yeah, you would, you, would, you know you would never know the difference. I can, I can remember when we first went down there, when we drove down there that evening, uh, we actually passed through old Bill, and uh, that was at right obviously Homes Road next to McDonald's, and I can remember the old Bill looking at me. And I was in full, full uniform, or full regalia, police hats on, everything, and and I and I went like, that. and he went, and that's for me. And we just carried on going. My mate said, "You're a cunt," you know that. You know, so we just carried on going. And as we were just about to pull up the first time when we went on it, there's a police car came behind us, and the siren went off. So you know, it was, it was, it was you know, but we just kept our call. And we just drove around again. So instead of going on it, then we just drove. So you're around. in an actual marked police car as well. Yeah, we, well, we had we had uh, police fans. We only had it marked on one side. Right. We don't want it. We, we so when we pulled onto the pavement, yeah, no one could. All they could see was a white van. They couldn't see it was old Bill. Right, but gotcha. For, but for the people inside, they could see police on the side. So when we opened it, visually they saw police in the car. There was a blue light as well in the dashboard. You could buy it for fucking two yeah. bob. So you know, visually, the security guards in there. You know, don't, you got to remember that most security guards are either ex-old Bill, ex-army. Uh, so they all, they all, uh, they all respect authority. Yeah. So they're not gonna they're not gonna start fucking effing and blinding the same who are you. They're not like yeah. you know, idiots. You know, so they so visually they saw we was we spoke the lingo, we all had mics on and we, we conducted ourselves in a way that, that was appropriate for that job. And you know, and you know, we never used any violence, but it was all about just taking control of it. And then it was just it was all about them first couple of minutes. Yeah. So once we once we'd done that first couple of minutes and we was in there, we knew that that everything was going to be all right. I think we had one hairy moment in there where uh, two uh, technicians actually turned up. So we had, we had already had like 16 people wrapped up downstairs in, in the, the, um, the stairwell. And then, and then all of a sudden I, I got a call on the mic because my, my, my mate was downstairs in the reception. He said, there's two geezers coming to the reception. Oh, so I said, what are they, they dressed like? He said, one's, one's carrying a bag. I said, the, the, the technicians just calm yourself down. Don't say fuck all near. Yeah. I didn't want the rest of them to hear because I, I didn't want them to spook them. Yeah. So, uh, so, so what did you do with them two guys? Just let so them go about did, their we business? Just, we just let them in. So they, they went in and they, and they went to the lift. But I know what I did. I waited at the, the, the lift. I thought, if they come out of the lift, I'm going to have to take both of them down. Yeah. Because everyone was grafting. They was doing their bit. I thought, if they come out now, I'll have to either blag it take them down, cuff them up, whatever it's going to take, just to keep them under control. But they went to the third floor. Right. So as soon as they went to the third floor, my guy who was in the CCT room by now was following him. So I said, just keep an eye on them. If they start moving about, just let me know. And luckily mm -hmm. they never, they went in their rooms and they was doing their, their, their technical stuff. And mm -hmm. that was it. So, you know, I think, I think you know, we was in there 50, 55 minutes, you know, we had an hour, we had an hour to do it. We, we got fucked on the going in there, so we, we lost five or six minutes. And then at six minutes past 10, the alarm went off, you know, the screen went up. Yeah. 
which was understandable because that's what if you don't clock in then it all got all, all, all broke lease so that's an automatic it's an automatic uh, buff system. yeah because because uh, i you know if you if you look at a normal warehouse normal warehouse they have um they'll have checks every every hour or every two hours yeah so way guy they got little they got little keys and they go around they put the key there key there key there key there and it sets it sets it and then and then uh, an hour later they get a phone call saying everything all right yeah all sweet buff and then and then an hour later buff 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 so, so if you miss that, that doesn't go in then it if you miss that and then all of a sudden up. it go it shuts down there's something's not right there's no reason why that can't happen or yeah. shouldn't happen and then then all of a sudden the bell gets rang regardless and the old bill turn up can i just ask you about you said there was an an airlock system on yeah. the doors can i just ask you about that yeah what well, is it's it's um it's like it's, it's like um um it's like an air dock pressure door yeah. so what happens is you go you, you go into this door and what it does it pressurizes yeah. and both of them doors cannot open simultaneously you know you, you know you have to open one without the other so they have yeah. to be shut so that one's got to be shut so you can't let someone in yeah and you can't walk you can you can't leave that one open and open this one and you run through so it has to reach like a certain air pressure it's, it's before a, yeah, that door releases. Yes, it's, it works on a, 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 a thermostatic uh, pressure. Yeah. So that has to be, you know, that has to be sealed. So once it reseals and it calibrates itself, then it opens that door. You can just you can just open it. Yeah. But I've, I've actually known guys that have been on Wits of Work, and what have, you have three of them doors. Right. So what what they done because they because they what they didn't trust it. What they did they left this door open. They wedged it open, open this one, and then shut it and couldn't get out. So that's why I call it the, the, the human trap. Got yeah. So if you if you try and cheat the system, you, you're, you're locked fucked. in there. So if you if you if you if you if you, if you don't do it properly, this side you're fucked. In the middle of it, you're in no man's land. And you know, and it's bulletproof glass. So you're you're fucked. You're so you, you know, it's, it's happened quite a few times over the years. Yeah. You know, I've 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 known it to happen to to a few guys, and you know, it's it's I don't know, it's just one of those things. How, how, just going back to that, so the pressurised door locks. How long have you got to wait in there before you can sort of it's get only, stuck it's, in there before you can get out? It's only it's only like less than thirty seconds. But still, in that sort of situation, yeah, you know, you're, you're, it seems like a lifetime. Well, you know, I can, I can remember going in there and standing there because you know we I, I went in first. Yeah. So it's, you know, it was all on me to get through there and get this 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 head of security and get his card off him because once I got that biometric card off him, I could open it. I can open it automatically. I won't have to. Right. I won't have to wait for the buzzing or for it to, to adjust. Good, yeah. I can just buzz it in and open, and I can buzz in everyone. Yeah. So, so did this story. So obviously you've you've got away with the job. You've come out. Yeah. What was the sort of media focus around with this sort of story? Well, we, we, was, we was first of all the first night was in. It was on a television. It said like a group of uh, uh, robbers have gone down, uh, uh, dressed as police officers, and it was a high value job. Blah blah. But over the next couple of days, they said like, it was a burglary. And they said there was only three right. of us, and there was ten of us. So they, and I thought, I thought why, why are they minimising it? Why are they uh, playing it down? Why are they playing it down? And then they said, and then they said it was <coughs> a million quid. Then they saw it, it was four million. And then on their on their on their official website, it's a couple of days later, it said five million pounds. Blimey! And then they, when when the uh, the reporters asked them about the data on there, they said it wasn't a little bit to uh, discuss that. But as far as they know, no data was stolen. Right. So we thought, well, you know what? We didn't really give a fuck simply because. If they want to put it down as a robbery, fair enough. A uh, burglary, then fair enough. Yeah. Because the less publicity we get, it's good enough for us. Yeah. Um, if they want to minimise it as far as value is concerned, and then, then again, we, we, didn't, we didn't care. We, we had done the job, and that was it. We only realised afterwards that MI5 um, were involved because there was, there was a lot of information. If you, if you look at um, the Big Depression, in, in, uh, I think it was, was it, uh, in 33, yeah? Uh, I think over nine thousand banks went down, you know, because they, they lost they lost confidence in the banks. So nine thousand banks shut shut down all across the world. Um, and and when in two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight is when you had the prime mortgage scandal. Yeah. So you had loads of banks. They you know we, if we just take one bank, uh, which is Wells Fargo, yeah, one of the biggest banks in America. They actually employed a CEO that actually opened three million bank accounts. Without telling telling the customers, oh, mate. he then in, introduced a system where he would find people for not paying their loans back. So he he created a system where he opened these bank accounts. He was actually fined 184 million pound, um, but they earned 120 billion in that year, um, and and he was actually fined uh, for for organising the, the loan system in such a way that it, they penalised the customers. Right. So he then had to pay another, he was fined another billion 
and then he he um, he, he uh, was um, he had to com- compensate the customers for four billion. But again, in that year, he was he earned twenty billion. So we were still so so, 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 he, so yeah so you so so you know he, he actually paid for them to to be corrupt. Yeah. So the same same if we take that same analogy and put it into what was on his on his motherboards. That information on them, you know, we had people, uh, the people that actually organised that who came to us were part of an Irish syndicate, an American banking syndicate. Um, and I know that in Ireland at that time, they were, they were taking like, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of pounds and yeah. building loads of uh, property over there. Right. And that worked on the same prime mortgage thing. They, they were lending money knowing full well that people couldn't pay them back. However, lots of banks were earning a hell of a lot of money. Yeah. And the same thing happened in America. You know, we're talking, if we bowed out the Royal Bank of Scotland for 35 billion, you know, you can imagine what they were nicking in America. We're talking hundreds of billions of pounds. So the information that was, that was on these motherboards was worth a lot of money to someone, and uh, they wanted them. You know, we didn't know at the time. It was only when MI5 actually came and saw me in Wandsworth and said, look, you can fucking, you can be out of here by, by this evening. We want the motherboards, yeah. and we want all your, all your crew, we want the people that organised it. Can, can I just ask you sort of, Obviously, we jumped a bit there too when you've been arrested. So, yeah. how did this? How did it come about? How did the, the arrest come about, or uh, how did you get questioned or pulled into it? It was about a year. About, well, it's uh, exactly ten and a half months later. I was at, actually in Lee Grave. Yeah, I was walking along the street. My, 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 one of my pals had been nicked uh, for a bit of work, but he used police uniforms. Right. So what he done? He done. They done. Uh, they took my picture because I was a mate of his. They done all all known associates of his. Right. And what he did, they showed my picture to security guards. And, and it came down the line, this is the guy that was responsible for Verizon and a number right. of other robberies involving police uniforms. I won't go into them because I've never been nicked for them. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, I, I, I think at that time, I, 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 I don't know, about 50 police forces come down and, and question me. Really? Uh, and they showed me CTT cameras that supposedly being me going into places, but back in them days, all the CTTs used to be up on top, so they used to be looked down, so they couldn't really do nothing. And, and, and the MO, that I was using with, 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 with dog. So the MO had changed, so they couldn't really do me for them. So they just done me, they done me the, the ones that have been, that I used the uh, dogs with. Yeah. So I got done for free, free uh, using dogs. Anyway, I was, I was up in Lee Grade. I'd, I'd, I'd moved on, I'd rented out a little place up there. I was living on a canal boat as well in, in a weekday. I was trained every day in the gym. And, I, and I, no matter where I went, in London or anywhere, you know, five minutes later, the old bill began in, in you know, smashing down doors. Um, you know, they were just going everywhere. You know, so they were really sort of looking into you as. Oh yeah, it was a special team. They had a 70, a 70 squad team on me. I didn't realise at the time. Blimey. It's only when I got nicked. It was a special squad they set up for organised crime. And uh, I can remember my, I phoned my dad once. You know, because we had, I used to have throwaway phones like that. And and I, and I got one of my phones delivered to his ass, and he, he said, all right, all right, how you doing? I said everything's sweet. He said I, I wouldn't come near me. He said he said the old bill across the road. He said, my neighbour phoned me. He said, they've got, they, they got one of his rooms. Oh, you're you know, joking. So, in so, there. They, so he said, just stay away. So <coughs> you know, I, knew, I knew they was on it anyway. So, so they were plotting up everywhere, watching your yeah, actions you know, and what you're doing. Ex-girlfriend's asses, fucking everything. Oh, my really? Kids, my kids' asses. You know, I'd, I'd speak to my ex-girlfriend and she'd say, there's a couple of guys here. He's got a, a workman's hat on. He's got a plank of wood holding it, walk up and down. But he's got brand new fucking shoes on the trainers. So, you know, so it didn't take the brains of Morbius to actually realise that they wanted us, they wanted yeah. us, you know what I mean? You know, you know, it's understandable, I suppose, when you, when you think about it, we took the piss. You know, we used police uniforms. But I can remember, I, you know, I was, I was just going over to Thailand. I'd ordered, I'd ordered a passport, and uh, I was supposed to pick up the day before. The guy that, 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 that I was supposed to pick up let me down, and I'd arranged to meet him at Luton Airport and pick up and then fuck off. And uh, as I was on my way, as I was supposed to meet him that evening, I just went out and get something sweet, and next thing, the whole, the whole street came alive with old Bill. Really? Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was walking along, I was on the phone to my, one of my pals in London, and the uh, next thing, a, a, a car came up on the verge, and there was a wall here, and I thought, oh, fuck, I threw the phone over the wall, went to turn, another one came now, then a van pulled up, and then that was it, all hell broke loose, and the next thing, it was on the floor. I was spread eagled, had a few digs, and then... Uh, and I just said, you know, what's going on? You know, what's, what, you know, what's the problem? And they said, oh, we've got him, we've got, we've got the cunt. You know what I mean? And I said, well, you've got who? You know, my, you know, my name's Eddie, Eddie O'Brien. Uh, you've obviously got the wrong person. You know, I said, no, we haven't got no fucking holding pictures up and everything. We got him, we got him. But I changed a lot. You know, I've lost a bit yeah. of weight. Yeah. 
Uh, and you know, so there was a, for about a few or three or four minutes, I was a little bit pensive about is this really him? Because I, I was, I was just, I was quite cool and just denied it. Yeah. And in the death, they said, you know, it's fucking him. Get him, put him in a car, bring him back to London. Oh, and that was, and that was when, you know, when I realised that the game was up. Yeah. You know what I mean? So at that point, you didn't know for what you was being arrested. I know, I knew what I was going up for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, it was, it, was, uh, it was definitely Verizon. Right. You know, it was. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was definitely Verizon. <laughs> you know, you know, lots of people have, have gone in. You know, you know, I was, I was fortunate. Only one of my pals had ever been nicked for it. Yeah. You know, so I knew I knew that he he was already in prison. Uh, so I knew that you know it was only a matter of time. So yeah, you know, you know, I looked upon it as well. You know what? There's no there's no guns. There's no there's no one got hurt. There's a clean bit of graft, and you know what? It's not the end of the world. It's a hundred million quid of data. It's five million pounds of data, uh, penny and shit, but. Uh, they, haven't, they, haven't retru- they haven't got anything back, so they're just a bit pissed about that. Right. So they okay. never, they've never, and they never nicked anyone else. So they, you know, I can understand why they, why they, uh, they put a lot of effort into finding this to make an example. Yeah. Got you. Um, but yeah, you know, it was one of those things. I got caught, came back to London, and I, I, at that stage, I was pretty, I was quite relieved. But in, in, in another sense, I, I, I wanted to get away. Yeah. Um, and I stayed in the police station for uh, three days. I went back to. Um, Pentonville, they put me in Pentonville, and then they, they, they came and picked me up and said, like, we, we'll take you down to an ID suite. So, right. so you know, apparently loads of security guards wanted to have a, have a look at me. And they wanted oh, to like me, an ID yeah, parade type yeah, of thing. Yeah. So I went down there, and, and luckily, you know, for me, you know, as, as we went down there, when I got in the van, the, the, the screw put uh, my cuffs on loose. Right. So I had this sort of internal battle with myself, whether to, to, to break out the van. Yeah. And 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 uh, uh, and trying to escape or just just go with the flow, and um, as I was going along, my it got loose, and I just and in the death, I pulled it off. So I'm in I'm in a van now. I've got the driver, two two screws with me, or two old Bill. I got uh, I think three old Bill in the, in the car in front, three old Bill in the, in the in the back, in the car behind us, and we pulled into St Anne's ID suite, and. Um, I can always remember thinking, fucking hell, you know, I need a lot of luck here if I'm going to do these lot, you know. And I was quite handy. I could box, kickbox yeah. and taekwondo when I was younger. So I was, I was always quite confident I could do two people or three at max and get away with it. And I got two, two guys in their fists. I thought, I'll have these two fuckers. The driver is no problem. And, and he got out. He got out and went in. I thought, I would love my first bit of luck. And then the other car pulled up across, across from us and they all stayed in it. And the other car pulled up, and I thought they all stayed in the car. I thought, fuck me, I got two guys in with me, and, and I'll do both these mugs. And, and then, and then, but, you know, but I didn't, and, and then there was a part of me thinking, like, if you do both of them in the van, and you won't be able to open this fucking door. Yeah, you know, stuck in I'm stuck in here. So, as I was thinking it, he actually pulled the door open, one of them, and stepped down. And I thought, fuck it. So I'll, I'll just move forward and went, bam, smashed him, put him down on the deck. And I, as I went around the corner, two old Bill came through the gates. So I ran back and jumped on a car, uh, jumped on a van, and, and I jumped for the wall, it was about 15 foot high. And uh, my, my cuff that I had was already on, because only one came off, it yeah. caught on the top of the wall. So as I tried to pull myself up, I, I lost the grip there. Oh, but, as, as, and, but, you know, they, I, all I was screaming behind me is, I tell, <laughs> you know, I was screaming their bollocks off. The next thing, uh, someone had grabbed me around the neck, I got a whack in the back. Someone was on me on my legs, and the next thing I've, I've, I've fallen down in between the, the van and the, and the wall, and I'm getting weighed in. You yeah. know, I'm getting like fucking. They've re-handcuffed me, and I was, I was quite fortunate. My uh, my barrister or solicitor came in there just at that time, and, and said like, Terry, what's going on? And I, and I was a bit dishevelled, and I was, I was getting weighed in like fucking. Yeah. Like, no one's business. And I said like, you know, I've just got in a van. They just all jumped me. You know, he said, leave him alone. <laughs> so. So with that, they said, like, you know, he's tried to escape. They cancelled the ID parade, and the next thing I knew, I was back, back the sirens going back to Pentonville. Oh, bloody. And then they put me in an escape suit, and then I, was, I, spent, I spent a few months in an escape suit. But when I got back there, they said, uh, I, had, I had three broken ribs, a busted eye, busted shoulder. And uh, they said, look, it's obviously not right about you. <laughs> not many people fucking <laughs> tried to escape. Um, you know, and do the things you do. Maybe it might be a good opportunity for you to actually see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So I said, oh, fuck off, you know what I mean? I, 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 I don't want to see anyone. But I think three months, uh, three weeks later, they, someone came in my cell, um, a psychologist, and, and said, would you like to have a, have a, have a Kit Kat with me? So I said, yeah, all right, come and have a chat. 
and then like you know I started speaking and I realized that my thinking was completely fucking flawed you know my 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 I had no empathy I had no fear yeah um and and what I thought was normal about what I did with my life um I realized I was I, I really needed some help mm. um but you know I went through this, this this period of talking for about six or seven weeks and and then um I was down a block at the time, unfortunately, and uh, I had a bit of trouble with the governor there because there was loads of cockroaches in my cell. And um, so I was, I was doing a bit of therapy and I was trying to, trying to find out what I was about. But I remember him coming down when I was in the cell down and I said, I can't really live in these conditions down here with all these fucking cockroaches. Yeah, it must be horrible. No. Yeah, yeah. You, know, I, you sleep know, with things called navy on it. I, th I think what, they, what most people think, if you're a criminal, you deserve this shit. You know, you got to think, you know, we were... You know, we were quite well-to-do uh, criminals. We had lots of money. We lived in nice houses. We don't live in shells. I mean, I never seen a cockroach or a fucking spider or anything yeah. in where I lived. It was all nice. And all of a sudden, I got cockroaches coming out of everywhere in my bags and everything else. So I, I took a front to this, and he basically just laughed at me and said, don't tell everyone else they all want one. And I went, all right. And, you know, it was a few weeks later. I was back on the wing, and I was in, I was in like, a, a cell on my own with a suit on because you, you, you're not... You Can I just pick up, when you said about you had an escape suit on, yeah. can, you, can you explain what that is? What it's, exactly it's a is yellow it? and green suit. So and what is it, like a sort of... It's a, it's a boiler suit, so you can't have no clothes. So if right. you escape, they can spot you 100 fucking miles away. Right. So you look like a banana. Got you, you know so I mean? it's just the colour, it's not yeah. restricted as such. No, no, because in most prisons you wear your own clothes or you wear prison clothes. Right. But if you wear this big yellow and green suit, you, you are what you are. You're an escape or you're a like dangerous like. prisoner. Right. So, so you're in that 24 hours a day. And then you know you have, you go to the canteen on your on, with the prison with a screw, you know you go you got you got to be escorted to get your dinner, your fucking tea, and you go mm -hmm. and exercise on your own. So it's a bit of a nightmare, but you know it's it's actually a, it's actually like a like a, a special pass because you know you don't have to queue up for nothing. Yeah. And you know, when I we you know like you have got Charlie Bronson, he's been in the secure unit forever. Yeah, for years. I can understand. I can understand why he does that because you know what you're. You don't have to mix it with other screw, uh, cons. You don't have to queue up for anything. And I, I can understand why, you know, because prison is, is a bit of a shit hole. Yeah. Anyway, getting back to the, the governor, I, I, came, I came back to the wing and, and there was loads of cockroaches in this cell where I was staying. And uh, I, instead of killing them, I, I put them in a, in a, in a plastic uh, a HMP bag. Right. And I think over that course of a couple of weeks, I put 120 in there, you know. Um, because I was, I wanted to show the, the people that came around and do the inspections. They they have an, a yearly inspection, and um, I can remember my mate came and gave me some some food, some bits of chicken and bits and pieces, and the screw let him in, but he left my door open. So he, he assumed that my mate, because he works on the landing, was gonna gonna shut the door when he left. Unfortunately, yeah. he never he had the screw, and then um, he shut it, and I, I pulled it to, and uh, next thing I had the governor's voice. I, I, I looked through the door and I saw him there, but he was with about 20 or 30, you know, women, they were clipboards on and geezers, yeah. they were clipboards. But it was a yearly inspection of, of uh, Pentonville. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So, so and he, and he had his back towards me and uh, he had three or four screws of him and they was all pretty lax because they, everyone was banged away. And they were talking about the conditions in Pentonville. And I never had a mention of a cockroach or fuck all. So I thought I'd go out there and give it to him. So I picked, picked the bag up and I stood behind the door and there's that, I used to have this voice when I do a bit of graft. There's one voice that always says, don't do it, please tell. You know, don't do it, look at, you know, you're going to get in so much shit if you do this. Or, you know, don't do that. And there's always, you know, but there's always that stronger voice to me, just fucking do it. You know, yeah. with escape, just do it, just yeah, do yeah. it. And then all of a sudden, I got this voice was there and saying, just fucking do it, tell. So I thought, fuck it, I'll pick, open the door and I'll pull the cockroach over his head. And then I'll just throw him over all your all these other people and they were screaming <laughs> ran up the landing because I, I think it was the first time he saw a cockroach <laughs> and next yeah. thing I knew I had four or five screws on me weighing me in and, and they threw me in the cell and five minutes later they come in and grabbed me again and then they took me down the block and they gave me a bit of a screw retribution but it wasn't that bad it was yeah. just I just curled up you know and, just, and then that was it they fucked off and I spent a couple of weeks down the block and they shipped me out to Wandsworth and oh, that's man. when that's when the MI5 came and saw me while I was in Wandsworth yeah I didn't realise at the time, I just thought it was an old bill. You know, so in the next thing I did, it was about half past one in the afternoon. You normally have visits at two o'clock, uh, so they come around for visits. So I had, I had the screws coming down and landing, and I thought, can't be for me, because I, no, I ain't got no one coming to visit me today, because yeah. I knew, because I had a phone in, in, in there. And uh, so I knew no one was visiting me. And the next time I door, I said, you got a visit? I said, I haven't got a visit. They said, you have. I said, I ain't. They said, you have. 
So, so, so when the email five come, do they not have to sort of offer you a solicitor and all that? Can no. they just come in and no. talk to you? No. Well, what happened is, is I said I never had a visit. They said I did. So what did they take you down to a special interview room? Right. They got them in one They got about five or six rooms down now. So when I went in there, uh, I went down there. They said, all right, you wait in the room. But when I went through, I saw like there, there was two or three guys that there was. They did. They, they didn't look right. They was. They was. Uh, they looked like army. Yeah. They looked like army guys and. Uh, I thought, I thought they don't look they don't look too healthy. Anyway, and then I saw the security guard now. And I thought, well maybe they're old Bill. And uh, next thing I know he said like they, there's a couple of people we'll never were with you. And they shut the door and these geese said like we ain't gonna fuck around. We wanna work with you, we want all their mothers brought back. Oh. And we want all the all the people that done it, we want the people that hired you to fucking do it. And I said, Well, you better fucking have a long wait, mate, because you ain't getting fuck around me. Fuck off. And that was it. I said, Who are you? He said, don't worry about who we are. And I thought, oh, here we go. You know what I mean? So we spent 10 minutes going back and forth. They started asking me about banks. You know, do I know, you know, people that work in, in this bank, this bank, and all that. And I thought, what's all that about? Yeah. You know, so they were digging, they wanted to know Trying who... Trying to get a bit of information. Who, ...who the banks were, who eyed us, and everything else. So I never said nothing. And then the security come, come, come back, he said, like, you, might as well, you know, you might as well play ball with them until you're going to do a few years anyway, so you might as well give yourself an opportunity to get out of here. I said, oh, fuck off. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the next thing I know, they came back in and said, look, you know, they threatened me with, with, with lots of years, and they threatened my family, they threatened everybody, you know. So had you already been sentenced here, though? No, 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 I was you on not right. So, right. you know, they offered me an opportunity to walk out of there. So I said, look, I'm, you know, you ain't getting fuck away at me, you ain't getting no names, you ain't getting nothing, you might as well fuck off. And then they went, and I, and I asked the screw, I said, like, I want the log, and who, are, who, these, who, they, who they are. Yeah. And he just said, like, they weren't here. I said, what do you mean they fucking weren't here? I said, I just spoke to him. He said, they're not here, they're spokes. He said, they're not here. You'll never, you'll <laughs> never get anything out of us or anyone knowing that they were here. So I said, fair enough. I phoned my solicitor. I said, look, they've, they've just come and visit me. I said, I don't know who the fuck they are. He said he'd look into it and, and nothing ever happened. Never, nothing so he ever probably got silenced as well or told to leave it alone? Or? Well, you know what? It was quite funny because when I actually went up for a new hearing, because if you go guilty, you get a third knocked off. Right. So, you know, if you go guilty, you get a long drawn out thing, you get extra years. So I went on, the, on this new one and said, if I go guilty, what would happen? They said, are oh, you going to get 20 fucking years or whatever? I 20 went, years. I said, that's a bit steep, isn't it? So I said, oh, let me never think. I'm not fucking, I'm not going down this road. You know what I mean? So I might go guilty. You know, I might just get it out of the way. So when I was downstairs in the cells, knock, knock on the door, this geezer, the same guy came in, said, fucking, they were a little bit odd, wouldn't they tell? And I, he said, like, all you've got to do is give us all the motherboards, the people that sold it out. He said, you can fuck off home. And I said, nah. That's it, you know, and that was it. So, yeah, you, know, so you know, I think people, uh, I think people are under, under the illusion that you would, you would actually give up your mates yeah. or your friends. I worked with my pals for years. I've known them all from, since I was a kid. I suppose well, when you've when you've done a job like that, you've already you already know the consequences. So yeah. you've you know at the back of your head, if it all goes wrong, you know what you're up against, don't you? Yeah, yeah. We 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 worked for, together since we were kids. Yeah, you know, we were all grown men. You know, and I know that if any one of my mates or my boys uh, were working, we've got called, they would never say nothing. Yeah. Just wouldn't en enter their minds. So, you know, I think the old Bill think that, uh, that you know, that I I'm sure they come across some cunts who would give their mates mm. up. But when you come across people that have been in this life forever, yeah. you know, we just wouldn't do it. You know, you know, we know that if we get 10 years, we're going to do five. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to do five in uh, closed conditions. You'll do a couple in open conditions. It ain't the end of the world. You know, but you know your loyalty, with the, you know, amongst you, your lot is, is pretty, pretty strong. Yeah. And you know what, you couldn't live with yourself. You know, your family live in the area. You know, your kids grow up in the area. You know, so you just wouldn't do it. Period. Yeah. And you know, so knowing that, I know that if any of my pals got nicked, they would never, they would never, never grasp me up. Yeah. So you know, and I would never, never do the same to them. So, so it wasn't, it wasn't an internal battle. It was just an easy thing. Uh, and they offered, they said I could be home by Christmas. And I said, no, nah, fuck it. And then I ended up getting 17 years. 17? Yeah. How many did you serve out of that? Uh, eight, eight years, four and a half months. Blimey. Yeah. So we're going to wind up there for part one, Terry. That's been some, uh, some great stories in there. It's been really good. Um, I look forward to part two. Thanks for having me. Thank you.